<laughs> How are you today? I love you. I miss you. I don't have that much time, so I want to um, just dive right in to what I have to tell you about. But first, I want to tell you about this podcast. My friend Kenyon Adamchek. Am I saying his last name right? Do you know him? Yeah. Yeah. Kenyon Adamchek. He has a great podcast called I'll See You in Help. And it's like where him and a bunch of comedians read self-help books and then have like a guest and talk about it. It's real cute. I listened to it while I was in treatment last summer. And then um, I don't even really know him that well, but we're kind of just like friends online. I know that he knows sign language and I know sign language, but we've never signed to each other. But we do type. And um, he hit me up and he was like, hey, I love your podcast. Um, Would you give my podcast a shout out? And he offered to pay me. And I was like, that's so stupid. Let's have sex. No, I'm just kidding. I didn't say that. I I don't even mean that. (laughs) Um, This is why I used to get really edited heavily and then not anymore. And isn't that more fun for you? So he has a new podcast called um, Fuck You, Dad. It's a podcast where him and fellow comedian Nick Cartwright tell crazy stories about our dads and real crazy dad stories from listeners. So, fuck you, dad. Anywhere you can find podcasts. Um, I would love to be on that show. Anyways, um, hi. Hi. I love you guys. Uh, Thank you so much for waiting and sticking it out for that long break that I took. So I wanted to get another one out to you really quick. And um, thank you for responding to that one so quickly and just, you know, you all are so great and I really um, love and appreciate you so much. Especially shout out to my friend Derek who um, I've never met but we text regularly and he like listened to the last one and then he was like, B, I'm mad at you. I was like, why? And he's like, don't call yourself a slut. He was like, you can just like be promiscuous and enjoy sex and like men aren't called that. And really, I just think a slut is someone who is, like, um, sexually successful. Like, I just think that because if I try to have sex with someone, I usually get to have sex with them. Then, yeah, that makes me really slutty. You know, just like anyone. Um, But anyways, I I love you. I love you. (laughs) Um, I love you and I think you're great. And so this episode is about pain. um, But... Not the emotional kind, which I've gone into depth in, you know, ad nauseum. But this this one is about physical pain, which I've touched on a little bit. Um, I am going to go back kind of to the chronological order. And then I'll also just do whatever I want. And also James's mic is on because everybody said that they love you. <laughs> Isn't that cute, though? Yeah, it's pretty cute. <laughs> like they don't even know you, but like that's it's like sweet that they like they know you're behind the scenes. And then I got so many messages from people that were like, "Hey, that was great. He's cool. Like loved hearing from him. Like loved hearing his thoughts and <laughs> and feelings because he has to sit here and like you know just kind of take it. You know, every every time I'm in here. Yes, thank you for acknowledging me, everyone. <laughs> uh, this is not usually my forum. Uh, but uh, I appreciate you appreciating me. <laughs> but you're around podcasts so much. Isn't it weird to I not mean, talk? I'm See, here we, we're going to go down this road, dude, and it's going to be <laughs> 20 minutes of me talking again. No, it's okay. No, like, yeah. I mean, I run a like a network, for God's sake. It's, it's like just constant. I'm on, I do talk on a lot more shows, but this show is different. And it's like, honestly, like it's special. Like there, there oh. is not another show like this on the entire network or really anywhere. Shout else. out people of comedy. Thanks man. <laughs> if you um, like podcasts, check them out. Yeah. There's a lot of shit that, uh, some of you woke people won't like too much on that. <laughs> uh, one of, uh, one of the hosts of one of those shows is actually in the middle of getting canceled right now. And I think I might canceled? be next. Uh, I'll tell you after the fucking thing, but Ooh, it's uh, there's some dirt, you guys. You know what? Fuck it. Uh, we got we got an army of listeners here. If you want to <laughs> listen to a show that's uh, a fucking joke and none of it is serious at all, you can go ahead and listen to Hillary with Todd Massey and Bobby Butts. <laughs> uh, and that's it's, I like Bobby. I think like we're not friends, but I think that he's funny. He's fine. <laughs> he's fine. Um, and that's kind of the only other show that I would consider myself to be like part of. Sure. Every other show, I'm just a, you know, I'm young Jamie from Joe Rogan. I'm just ask me to Google shit, and I will Google it for you. I didn't know that was one of your superpowers. That's, that's, just, just wait. Just wait till this room gets upgraded. <laughs> you have no idea. But anyway, back to your podcast about you. Oh, yeah, right. So, I had a tube in my lungs 
for about a month and a half to two months because my right lung completely collapsed. And there was a tube that would like drain all of the fluid out of it. And um, and then I had to have the tube pulled out. Do you know what it's like to have a tube inside of your body and then have them pull it out so they can be like, all right, now we're going to stitch it up. Sounds great. <laughs> I screamed. I told them I didn't want them to do it. They had to hold me down. Two people had to hold me down. And this one nurse had to make really intense eye contact. And she was like, you're going to get through this. And I went through a lot of stuff up until that point. I mean, that was like after I jumped off a building, after I was like out of the ICU, after I had already had several surgeries. But I was so drugged up at that point that that was the first time that I was really like scared of how much something was about to hurt. And it hurt exactly as much as I thought it would. Yeah, it was fun. <laughs> Sounds like uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be experiencing that in my 70s when they shove a catheter up in me or something. Oh, I had one of those, too. God damn it. You know what's worse than having a catheter shoved in? No, no, don't. I don't even want to think about it pulling it out, dude. Yeah, pulling it oh out. That's what God. I was going to say. <laughs> oh it's so God. much worse. It's so much worse. It burns, and then it's really hard to pee on your own afterwards. God, yeah, I can't. You have to, like, push it out, your urethra, okay. which, like, hasn't been used. All right. You know? And it's hard to, like, think about peeing. And like it with an intentional way of being like, okay, this is uncomfortable. I haven't done this in however long. For me, it was three months. I hadn't peed on my own in three months when they pulled it out. And they were like, you're going to be real susceptible to like infections after that. And I'm like, shout out every UTI I've ever had since then, you know, (laughs) Um, which is like constantly like a a guy like (laughs) looks at me funny and I'm like, okay, I just got a UTI. Thank you so much. (laughs) You know, it's like a hot day and I'm like, I can't wear shorts because I will get a UTI in five minutes if I go outside. But yeah, is this fun? <laughs> is this fun? It's great. great. <laughs> Catheters. I have like a pretty long list of all the things that, <laughs> that I that I went through and that I had to experience physically. But it's weird because it's like physical pain. Honestly, hear me out. It's so good for you. Oh yeah. It is cleansing. It is like it is spiritual. It is transformative. Like. Women who give birth and have like tough labors, like they are never the same afterwards. Like people who go to war, people who've been shot, people who've had serious traumatic injuries, like they're not the same afterwards because pain humbles you. There is no true growth without pain. Yeah, but like you have to like like hurt though, like physical pain, not mm-hmm. just like that, you know, because pain could be anything. It could be emotional. It could be it could be spiritual. It could be like, you know, an intangible concept. Yeah. But, like, to actually feel it because your flesh has been cut open for whatever reason. One, there's the psychological effect, too. I'm glad you said uh, intangible because there's a (laughs) tangible psychological effect of you watching your pain heal. Yeah. Oh, good point. That uh, that can affect you even greater than, like, a nebulous mental thing that's going on with you. I love that word. Nebulous? Yeah. It's great. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Well, so I was given a lot of pain medication, too, in the hospital, and I've talked about this cocktail before, but, oh my God, one more time, for the people in the back, a milligram of Dilaudid, or no, a full gram of Dilaudid, actually. I I went to three different hospitals. I was in the hospital for six months. I was in a hospital in Illinois and in Florida. I had seven surgeries. By the end of it, they were giving me a gram of which is an insane amount of pain medicine, a gram of Dilaudid every four hours. Oh my God. I know. Oh, my God. And then they would give me um, Zofran for the nausea, so, like, no side effects, and then Benadryl for the itching, which also kind of, like, when they give you the Benadryl, it gets you more high. So I would have no negative side effects of this, like, really intense heroin, synthetic heroin-like high. And I would get high. And every time they would ask me how much pain I was in on a scale of 1 to 10, I would say 13. And I was it was always true, so they would always give me more medicine. I was always in pain. But pain medicine actually doesn't doesn't cure <laughs> or like alleviate your pain really. Pain is caused by inflammation, and it doesn't alleviate that at all. What it does is it gets you high and it distracts you so you can like sit through it. You know. <clears throat> oh man, and I 
Oh, I sat through it. I sat through so, so much stuff. Let's see. What else? Um, they put the the bracket in my arm upside down. So it was like too big and it was upside down. The American healthcare system is really um, Stella. But um, so my arm was like super fucked up and they were always trying to give me physical therapy for something that, you know, couldn't be fixed. And they were like, stretch your arm. And I'm like, it hurts, you know. And they also really don't. Did you know that they don't listen to women? especially black women, but they don't listen to women when as much when they say they're in pain. Just kind of just like, what? <laughs> like, what? I don't bleed. This doesn't hurt. <laughs> Let's see. Um, my forehead had to be stapled together. Yeah, I have this dent, but like before it was this, it were giant staples because it was just like straight cut. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um... You can't see it if you follow me on Instagram because I'm not like, here's the dent in my forehead. <laughs> but it's it's so it's so there. And um, I've had this experience over and over again. Anytime I wear my hair up or I like don't have bangs is that I watch someone who doesn't know me that well, like notice it and then not ask and then continue on their business thinking, I wonder what happened to her fucking head. <laughs> you know, I've, I've seen you with your hair up a billion times. Never noticed it until just now. Well... That's what? <laughs> I guess I'm not looking at your fucking forehead all the time. I guess that's I mean, that's but like now sweet. that you mention it, you look like the fucking Death Star. <laughs> <laughs> and that's all I'm going to see for the rest of my life. I love that for me. Your fucking I've, tractor beam forehead. Well, I feel like it's kind of like Harry Potter. You know what I yeah, mean? Yeah, dude. You got that <laughs> magical scar shit going on. Yeah, a little bit. A little bit. So I'm, I don't know. I might fix it someday, though. But I also, I always said I would do it on my birthday. I'll fix it. My 30th birthday, because I would have to get, like, injections, uh, like, every six months or something. Dude, fuck cosmetic surgery, dude. Come on, you don't need this shit. Yeah, but, I, but it is, like, it is weird, and in, like, a professional setting, if I ever wanted, I mean, I don't, but if I ever did want to, like, assimilate with the normal part of society, it's hard to, like, go in into somewhere and be taken serious like even at my lawyer's office or like at a bank like i i do feel this like weird sense of like separation of they're like something fucked up happened to you and i don't know what it is and i'm not gonna ask but i'm obviously aware of it you know that's fair but i kind of like that in a weird way i don't know bring up your mind i will i will not (laughs) um okay so my arm my lungs Oh, I told you about the cystogram. That was really fun. Um, shout out that episode. I won't even bring you back to it. Just like go listen to Cringeworthy if you want to know. Um, I had a pick line. Do you know what that is? Nope. Okay, a pick line is where they stick a needle in your heart <laughs> to give you medicine like all day long. Cool. <laughs> Jesus. I know. Um, well, so I my bone went through my skin on my arm and it was like broken in half so it was exposed to air and whenever that happens you'll develop an infection called osteomyelitis which is a pretty serious bone infection and can ultimately cause you to like lose a limb or like lose your bones so a bunch of my bones were taken out but to save the rest of them they had to put this like needle inside of my heart so it could pump all of this medicine in all day long so like I would go and sit with all these like chemotherapy patients and I would get like an IV bag and then I would have to wear a fanny pack with like another IV bag in it and wear all day long and every six hours it would like pump medicine into my heart Um, and the medicine was so fucking intense it was an antibiotic but it was such a heavy antibiotic that it made my hair fall out it made me tired all the time it made me feel like physically sick and i was sitting with all these chemo patients and i was always cold and i like couldn't really walk that well and so i'm just like oh i'm literally like ex- i had to do it for eight weeks i'm like i'm literally like like going through chemo <laughs> right now it felt very similar it sucked. Oh, by the way, it sucked. <laughs> oh, I thought it was it sounded like a fucking party, dude. <laughs> um, all, right. <clears throat> all right. So I have four pins in my hips and I used to have these like metal bars um, that went through them called an X fixer. And then eventually after four months in, they like took them all out. 
but they like left these pins in my hips. And when I got out of surgery, I was like, something's wrong, something's wrong, I'm in pain, something is wrong. And um, they were like, yeah, we just gave you a bunch of pain medicine. And I'm like, no, no, no. I'm like, I really like feel something is wrong, like in my body. And they did an x-ray while I was like sitting there in the recovery thing right after surgery and found out that they had like left pieces of metal inside of me that they weren't supposed to. <laughs> that were like part of the x-fixer. And they're like, all right, we're going to give you some more pain medicine. because Obviously that fix it. Mm-hmm. And then they're like, look, it's like such an invasive surgery. It would be worse for you if we went back in and took them out. So we're just going to leave them in. And you're just going to have arthritis for the rest of your life. Cool. (laughs) When I went to my first doctor visit after I like got out of the hospital, they like took an x-ray of my hips and my doctor like looked at him and showed me how they're like not aligned and was like, you know, you can never give birth vaginally. If you ever get pregnant, you're going to have to have a C-section. And I'm like, all right, won't get pregnant during the apocalypse. Thank you. Good to know. But um, but what he also said was that I was never going to walk without a limp that because my hips were like uneven because there was like too much metal in them that I never walk without a limp. And I looked at him straight in the eye and I said, excuse me, doctor, we've never met. (laughs) And guess what? I don't walk with a limp. I don't. Good. I don't. It's amazing that I can walk at all, but like I don't walk with a limp. And you want to know what else is crazy? Like this is probably the craziest part that I'm almost nervous to admit because I know how it's going to sound because this is the craziest shit you'll ever hear. After all of this, do you want to know how much physical therapy I did? Zero. Zero. Did I tell you that one already? No, I just guessed. <laughs> I just fucking stepped all over your punchline, dude. How's that feel? <laughs> I'm fine. <laughs> Not a real comedian. It doesn't matter. <laughs> how uh, did you get away with zero physical therapy? Exactly. Exactly. So I had no money. I had no family. I had no help. First, I was in Illinois, in Chicago, and then, you know, my whole family was like, fuck you, and we're taking all of your money, and then I was, like, staying with this dude who was trying to fuck me, even though I couldn't walk. Men are disgusting. And um, and then I was like, okay, I gotta get the fuck out of here. So I, like, left in the middle of the night and flew to Florida and stayed with my aunt, ended up having to go back to the hospital, have two more surgeries, and then I was there in the hospital in Miami, and then, like, at her house in Naples, and... Afterwards, when I got out of the hospital and I was like on Roxy's, which <laughs> also is like so fun that they give you medicine when you get out of the hospital you, in a state in, where you can't even fill the prescription. I got out of the hospital. We went to six different Walgreens and CVSs and like none of them had it. So I had to like go back to a hospital that night, get a prescription for Vicodin and then wait until... Monday, when the pharmacy at the hospital opened, and then go spend five hundred dollars on two weeks worth of Roxy's, which I took for two weeks until I had a friend in California mail me a bunch of like edibles and CBD to my aunt's house. It was like CBD edibles from a dispensary in California, and she found them and she said, "This is a drug, and you have to go to rehab." As she's like handing me my Roxy's on like a dinner tray. You know, and I was like, oh, that's right. You're Hispanic. You're stupid. You don't understand science, you know, and I'm like, fuck, you know. So uh, then I as soon as she said that, she's like, you can't stay here unless you go to rehab, like rehab for drugs. And I was like, you're I'm like, you're so stupid. I can't stay here because you're too dumb to like have a rational conversation with. And I tried and I showed her articles and I tried to explain the science behind it. But she was just like, it's a drug told me some weird story about her friend who got too high in Vegas on weed, on a weed edible. Like, you know, and I'm like, yeah, I'm like, you guys are old. Obviously that like, (laughs) you know, I'm sure that was really scary for you. I'm like, that's not what's happening here. So, so then I left and I left Naples, went back to Chicago and I had no money. I had no family. I had no help. I had no friends. I had no, I could walk. (laughs) And it's like, how did I even survive any of that? You know what I mean? Like, I really like don't I don't even know except I guess what I'm here is to try and explain that to you is how I survived all of that but um, I basically just learned how to breathe I did a lot of dabs and um, and I like went through withdrawal for six weeks from that medicine and the withdrawal was so bad it was like heroin withdrawal it was you know six months of IV heroin use all you know weaned down to like 
whatever, 80 milligrams of Roxy twice a day to nothing overnight. And then it was like I would just I just had the worst flu I've ever had for six weeks straight. I would puke all day. I'd wake up and I'd have in like four in the morning and have like terrible diarrhea and then like puke all day. And then I would sweat like really bad night sweats, like to the point where my shirt would be like soaked and I'd have to like get up and like take a shower. And and then I would just like be like basically puking in the shower. (laughs) This is fun. (laughs) It's great. (laughs) I'm having a blast. (laughs) I get really bad sugar cravings too, which I've heard is like a symptom of withdrawal from opiates where I'd like wake up in the middle of the night and I'd have to like pound Pop-Tarts and Mountain Dew. Otherwise I wouldn't be able to go back to sleep. Was I talking about again? Oh yeah. CBD. Weed is good. Drugs. Opiates are bad. Yes. (laughs) I think that is the lesson. (laughs) I mean, but basically I'm invincible. Now, you know, even though I do get mad if a boy that I like lies to me, I still think that physically, mentally, emotionally, in some ways, I am invincible. Right? Oh, right. No physical therapy. Yeah. So I came back. I didn't have any money. I didn't have a job. I didn't have anywhere to stay. I was just like basically getting by on like good luck. You know what I mean? I like slept at a friend's house i couldn't walk barely but i was applying for jobs i started babysitting i would like ride the train like all day long until i had to either go to work or i could like wait till my friend got off of her nursing job and like meet her at her house and like sleep on her floor and i did that for about three weeks and then i found an apartment that was like four hundred dollars a month like moved in with this girl and then like kept this job and then got a better job and then got a better job got a better job and then like didn't get any help from my family or anything until my mom died that was the next time they like were like well we have to give you this money you know but also i guess uh, okay i'm gonna tell you a quick story i know we're we're like you gotta go no you're fine yeah i pushed it back Okay, I'm going to tell you a quick story about the most, (laughs) this is a different kind of pain, but this is the most painful memory of my entire life and will always be the most painful memory of my entire life. Nothing will ever, ever top this. And honestly, I'm sorry if I cry. I'm sorry in advance if I cry, Um, but maybe I won't. Maybe I'm just like really strong today. I don't know. Um, So the last time I saw my mom, the last time I physically saw her was in the hospital in Chicago. She had been calling me and telling me that she was coming to visit me um like over and over again and she'd say she was on her way and then the whole day would go by and she'd never show up and I'm like okay cool this is my childhood like (laughs) I know this one um so I never I never like relied on what she would say or I was never really expecting her but one day one day she did show up she showed up and she was so high she had like come to the hospital high And then she left and she went into the parking garage and smoked crack in her car in the parking garage and then got high on crack and then walked around the parking garage like did laps until her feet bled. And then she came back to my hospital room and then like passed out. And then I don't know, there was like they would come and take blood. They'd come and they give me medicine. They'd come and they check on me. And like so things were like constantly happening. And I was just like watching her and she's like passed out. And I'm like. Yep, I'm like, this is my mother. And then at one point, I passed out. And then when I woke up, I found out that my mom had, like, written herself, like, a $300 check out of my, like, checkbook that was, like, in my hospital room. And um, because my grandparents had brought, like, my wallet and some things and were just, like, you know, they they were there. My mom knew they were there. She wrote herself a $300 check, went and cashed it, and then, like, I never saw her again. And that was the last time I saw her. And then two years later, she died in her car in a parking lot of a forest preserve. And she was in her car for about two weeks before they found her. She died because she was smoking crack and her heart stopped. So, so, I mean, really, like, nothing can hurt me. You know? Do I talk now? (laughs) 
fucking. Well, I'm sure it's like everyone else feels awkward too. Like that's such a weird thing. That's a weird that's story. Insane. Yeah, it's sad though. It's sad, and it's like a, yeah, sad. That's the <laughs> three <laughs> letters for all that. Yeah, I mean, fuck's it, sake. It's dude. sad. It's sad. Oh my god. I hope I'm doing an accurate job of representing all of you out there <laughs> listening to this <laughs> unbelievable tragedy right now. What the fuck? Yeah, but so it's like I've jumped off a five-story building, but like that is the most pain I've ever been in. Is like that. Yeah. The cuz I it's like weird. Like I don't know my mom's favorite color. Like I don't know if she's ever finished a book in her whole entire life. So you say you say that was the last time you saw her. Yeah. Did you hear from her? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, like got into several text fights with her boyfriend. Her boyfriend ended up like beating her up and then went to jail for three months and then she was like on her own and I'm pretty sure my mom was a prostitute who like sold her body. For sure. Because my grandparents paid for her home and my grandmother would go over there and like give her food but, you know, they would never give her money. Right. And it's like, she didn't have a job. So sure. it was like, how do you make money? How do you right. even survive? How do you even have a phone? Like, what are you doing? You know? And no one in my family knew. And, like, she just, she had lost so much weight. Like, literally had lost, like, 50 or 60 pounds and Jesus. was, like, emaciated to the point where we're like, you look sick. Like, you're going to die. Like, can we send you to a doctor? And she's like, I don't do drugs. <laughs> like, yeah, that's... <laughs> <laughs> that's how a, yeah, that's how a sober person acts, for sure. Dude. Yeah, and she'd come to, like, family events, and, like, everyone would be, like, scared of her. And, like, and kind of how they feel about me now, you know, where it's they're just like, you're unpredictable. Like, we don't know what you're fucking doing. You're in a sex cult. You live in a bad part of town. Not anymore. No, you yeah, now you're in <laughs> another spot. <laughs> no, <laughs> now I'm in a nicer yeah. part of the city, so safer. Yeah. I mean, but that is nicer. You know, what is safe, though? We're never safe from ourselves, you know? And, like, the stuff that eats me away at night is, like, not these dumb guys, but, like, it's, like, my mom and, like, you know, generational trauma and, like... I just always think about her and like, it's like she never, she never got to heal, you know? And that's sort of like the unfinished business that I feel like I have with her yeah. death is like, she never got to like be happy or heal or get better. And um, even if, you know, physically I'll never heal, I do hope that on some level, emotionally and spiritually, like I can heal in a way that she couldn't, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this is, this like, is helping. This is well, yeah. <laughs> this is kind of proof that you are. You found a healthy outlet to do that. Yeah. Well, last night I f- pretended to fall asleep on this guy on this guy, so I wouldn't have to have sex with him. Because like we had been doing like my sex addicty stuff, and I'm like, okay, I found one person that I'm just like, I'll, you know, like fuck you until until we don't anymore. And then last night I was like, I don't even want to have sex. And then I just instead of being like, I don't even want to have sex with you, I just like pretended to fall asleep, and he like left. He couldn't figure out how to open my door, though, like, as he was going out. And so I was like, should I get up and help him get out? Or, like, should I just let it's him like go? It's like pretend to sleep talk, like, no, the door works like this. <laughs> you gotta jiggle the handle. He got it eventually. He got it eventually. So, but, um, I guess we don't talk anymore. Anyways, accepting applications. No. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I don't really want to fuck anyone who listens. But I also don't want to fuck you if you don't listen. So do without what you will. Anyways, um, I love you. Bye. <laughs>